Good morning. Before we begin, I would like to acknowledge that we meet and we learn from each other today on country. I'm coming to you from Gadigal land, where I live, work and write. I pay my sincere respect to Elders past, present and emerging, and I extend that respect to any Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander peoples who might be with us here this morning. Good morning, my name is Rachel Franks and I'm the Coordinator of Scholarship at the State Library of New South Wales. And if you've been to one of our Scholar Talks before, you will know that this, the Scholar Talk series, is actually one of my favourite parts of the job. An opportunity to hear from fellows who have worked so hard at the library, present their research and an opportunity too for us to celebrate some of their achievements. So today it's terrific to have Dr. Mark Dunn. Mark was a 2016 CH Curry Fellow and he has already given a preliminary talk on his topic for the library, but we wanted to bring him back because he has now produced a book from his fellowship, a really terrific volume, The Convict Valley. Now, some of you have already written to me and you've asked, but how can I buy the book and how can I get Mark to sign it for me? Well, we've been working hard with the colleagues in the bookshop and we'll have lots of information for how you can get a signed copy of The Convict Valley at the end of Mark's talk today. If you have any questions for Mark uh, from today's presentation, please use the chat feature in Zoom and we'll do a Q&A after his talk this morning. Thanks so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you, Rachel. And um, good morning, everyone. Um, it's great to be here, even virtually speaking at the library, which has been a great help to me in the research I've been doing for this book, The Convict Valley. And today I'm going to talk to you about an aspect of colonial history that has been somewhat overlooked, I think, and that is New the Newcastle Penal Station. And within this overlooked history, I'm going to focus on a particular aspect and that is even less well known, and that is the Aboriginal presence in that place for the 20 year period between the years 1804 and 1824. As the title of the talk hints that you should be able to see on your screen there, I'll discuss two of the better known individuals of that period, the men Bungaree and Burragon, as well as introducing another, Biraban, who is remembered as Reverend Lancelot Threckold's interpreter at his mission at Lake Macquarie. And I'll also touch on a range of other Aboriginal people in and around Newcastle during this period and examine some of the connections between them and the developing penal station. But before I go any further, I'd like to follow Rachel and acknowledge the custodians of the land that I'm speaking to you from, which is on the boundaries of the Gadigal and the Wongal, men and women of the Eora Nation, as well as those people on whose land the events I'm going to discuss took place, which is the Awabakal and Waramai people of the Newcastle area. Now, much of what follows is actually discussed in more detail in the book, The Convict Valley, which has been published uh, last month by Alan and Unwin and which emerged from research I undertook doing a PhD at the University of New South Wales and through a very generous fellowship, the C.H. Curry Fellowship, which was awarded to me, as Rachel said, in 2016 by the State Library of New South Wales. And also, uh, slight technical issues, my computer is not the best at this, so the slides are running via Rachel's computer, so um, forgive us for any small technical hiccups, but Rachel, if we could have the first slide, please. Thank you, perfect. So to introduce this story, I should also say I'm not gonna to talk to the slides, but I'm happy to answer questions at the end. So to introduce this story, I first wanna give a quick overview of the Newcastle Penal Station. Newcastle was established by the British in 1804 as a place where reoffending convicts were sent for a predetermined sentence to work in either coal mines, cutting timber or burning lime. The place itself was by then reasonably well known to the British authorities. It, is a, it had been first a sort of officially reported in 1797, 
and had been regularly visited by the ships of Sydney merchants to get timber and had even been the site of an attempted settlement in 1801. Now the first convicts sent to Newcastle were the surviving ringleaders of the Castle Hill uprising of March 1804. 34 Irish convict men with a military guard of 10, an overseer, a superintendent, a surgeon, and three experienced miners, plus the commandant, Charles Menzies, made up the first group and established the bones of the settlement that was to follow. And over the next 20 years, the white population varied between just over 100 for the first 10 years or so to around 1100 when the station closed. By that time, the outpost had developed in um, to a small town with a grid of streets, a collection of military buildings and huts for the convicts, there were storehouses and wharves on the harbour. Up the Hunter River at what is now Maitland and Morpeth, there were isolated timber camps and also a collection of small farms that Governor Macquarie had granted to well-behaved convicts in 1812 and 1814. It was a relatively small and isolated settlement, and that was one of its um, benefits for convict penal station, that it was isolated. Its main purpose was to punish convicts, but there was a secondary and increasingly important role as a place of economic stimulus to the colony by the extraction of natural resources. Of course, when the British arrived, they did not come into an, occupy, an unoccupied or empty place. This was Aboriginal land, the Awabakal and Waramai country, shaped and managed over thousands of generations. The British, as I said, were not unaware of this. Their first foray into the area was in 1790, when five escaping convicts were shipwrecked on the beach just north of modern day Newcastle. These men lived for five years amongst the Waramai people. They took Aboriginal wives, they had children, and they were given names by the Aboriginal group there, the Waramai. In 1797, another group of escaping convicts led to the official discovery of the Hunter by the British, when the pursuing government ship under the command of Lieutenant John Shortland waded out a storm in the harbour. It was Shortland's reports of coal and timber that sparked the interests of the colonial authorities as well as private merchants. And so in 1801, an official survey party was sent to investigate the harbour. Under the command of Lieutenant James Grant and including the Lieutenant Governor William Patterson, this party spent around six weeks exploring and surveying the harbour and the surrounds, as well as up the Hunter River to around modern day Maitland. Both Grant and Patterson reported favourably on the available resources and wrote the first eyewitness accounts of Aboriginal Newcastle. It was on this expedition that we have the first mention of Bungary being at Newcastle. Now in 1801, Bungary was already well known in Sydney. Indeed, after Benelong, he's probably the most recognised Aboriginal man in colonial Sydney. There are more surviving portraits of Bungary than any other person, Aboriginal or European, from the colonial period. In 1798, Bungary had accompanied two other Aboriginal men, a man by the name of Nambury and another called Wingal, on a 60-day round trip to Norfolk Island with Matthew Flinders on the HMS Reliance. And it's interesting to note that Wingard himself was a man from Port Stephens, north of Newcastle, and is an early illustration of the movement between the Hunter Valley and the Sydney area. Bungary went with Flinders again in 1799 to Harvey Bay, where he acted as an interpreter and intermediary. And it's in this role that Bungary goes to Newcastle in the same sort of um, employment by James Grant on the Lady Nelson. And of course, Bungary then goes on with Flinders to circumnavigate Australia. Now, on the voyage to Hunter's River, <coughs> Bungary skills are put to work fairly early. The Lady Nelson put ashore, put a boat into shore at Lake Macquarie and then returned with an Aboriginal man who identified himself as Ugury Dick. Bungary was asked to talk with this man and Grant noted that Bungary pointed to Budgery to sit down, which Grant had previously observed and knew to mean that they met in friendship. The two men then sat in silence for 20 minutes. Again, a ritual Grant knew to be part of the etiquette of the meeting. Although the men talked, Grant received very little information and assumed that Bungary could not understand Budgery Dick very well. As some of Grant's own crew who knew some of the Aboriginal languages from Sydney couldn't understand the conversation. But this seems unlikely. 
as Bungary is thought to be from Broken Bay, which is not far from where they'd picked up Budgery Dick. Now later, the Reverend Lancelot Threckold, who had a mission at Lake Macquarie from 1825 and learnt the languages, recognised a common coastal dialect that united people from Botany Bay all the way to Port Stephens. And if this was the case, then Bungary and Budgery would have easily understood each other. So why Bungary failed to tell Grant what was said remains a mystery. Uh, next slide, please, Rachel. So on arrival at Newcastle, much to Grant's dismay, Bungary left the ship and was next seen back in Sydney, presumably having gone overland. Now it's worth noting that Aboriginal men or women would usually need to have some connection to a place to walk off into another's country. And if Bungary had such a connection, it is equally interesting to think that maybe he had taken on the role as interpreter for Grant in order to get a lift to Newcastle himself. But on arrival at the Hunter, Grant and his party quickly became aware of the Aboriginal presence in the area. Their passenger, Bugjury Dick, had also left them, but returned the day after with two other Aboriginal men, one of whom knew Patterson from Sydney, and Patterson and him had a conversation on the waterfront. So here's another of those little moments that point to a larger story. If this unnamed, unnamed Aboriginal man knew Patterson from Sydney and was now in Newcastle, then like Bungary, he demonstrates that overland connection. The British also came across a weir in a nearby creek used for trapping fish by the Wabigal people. Now weirs and fish traps are sure signs of a continued and sustained presence in an area. And the deep and extensive middens that they saw around the harbour, some of which were up to two metres deep, are another testament to the long occupation of this place. And it was not only the people that their, and their technology that Grant and Patterson and the others noticed. Indeed, one of the first things the British remarked on, besides the coal lying on the beach, was the pasture like hills around the harbour, which were dubbed Sheep Pasture Hills by Patterson in 1801. For those of you who know Newcastle, this is the area of King Edward Park and Shepherd Hill. And there's a, I uh, will actually address the slide. If you can see the slide, it's um, essentially where this picture is being painted from. Now in charge of the survey, James Grant noted, and this is a quote, the spot where the coals are found is clear of trees or bush for the space of many acres, which are covered with a short tender grass, very proper for grazing sheep. The ground rising with a gradual ascent, intersected with valleys on which wood grows in plenty, sheltered from the winds and forming the most delightful prospects. So Grant's report then encouraged the first attempt at the permanent settlement in 1801. And there was a small party of soldiers and miners he left behind, which was soon joined by another group of convicts and guards. But the isolation and the hasty preparations hampered the camp's success and within 12 months it had been abandoned. The return in March 1804 marks the beginning of a permanent British presence in the area. As I've mentioned in my introduction, throughout the years of the penal station, Aboriginal people continued to come and go from Newcastle and the district. And the small scale of the Newcastle station meant that the impact of the British presence was relatively small on the traditional and day-to-day -day life of the people. But that's not to say there was no impact. There was, and there were the stirrings of the frontier violence here as well. Next slide, please. Now, although there is little to no personal correspondence from Newcastle from this period, unlike, say, the source material for Sydney, there is a good collection of official correspondence for these years. With the exception of a gap between around 1806 and 1812, for most of the life of the convict outpost, a steady stream of letters and reports from the various commandants gives us a picture of life there. As you might expect, most of this is concerned with the convict workers, with discipline and with the running of the station. However, there are many incidental mentions of Aboriginal life around the place as well. And so again, Bungary reappears in the Newcastle story in June 1804, just three months after the establishment of the station. Again, he comes by ship. This time Bungary has been tasked by Governor King to escort six Aboriginal men from Sydney, where they had turned up, back to Newcastle from where they were from. It is likely that Bungary's connection to the men or the place was one of the reasons he was chosen to take them home rather than just a random choice by the governor. King, in a letter, advised the Commandant at Newcastle, Charles Menzies, that in the future he did not think, again, quote, 
it would be advisable to let more than one or two strange natives come up at a time. Now, for King or Menzies to think they had any real influence on the movement of Aboriginal people across the country was a display of the level of ignorance that the British had about Aboriginal society at the time. Uh, next one, please, Rachel. Writing back after Bungary arrived, Menzies remarked that Bungary was the most intelligent of his race I have as yet seen, and should a misunderstanding unfortunately take place, he will be sure to reconcile them. In recognition of his work and value to Menzies, Bungary was then put on the stores and supplied with rations from the penal store at Newcastle. Menzies' reference to Bungary's ability to reconcile any misunderstanding hints at a relationship between the two men already established after only three months. Bungary had by then already assisted in the recapture of a convict runaway in the area, and he is the first named Aboriginal man in Newcastle to do so. This may have come at a cost though, for his father was killed by other absconding convicts while trying to return them to Newcastle. Now we do not know if these two incidents were related. The three runaways who killed his father were returned to Newcastle, <clears throat> but as the evidence of Bungary and the other Aboriginal groups who brought them in um, was not officially acknowledged, although it was acknowledged by Menzies, there was not enough uh, evidence to convict them. It appears likely that Bungary came and went with some regularity. An interesting point to make is that while he is well known in Sydney for his way of dressing in cast off or donated military uniforms, mimicking officers and Sydney residents in a sort of performative role. In Newcastle, he's only ever, ever recorded as being in a traditional role. Leading war parties, cooperatives, he was never dressed as he was in Sydney. And although he's not mentioned specifically as being there again until 1821, when he led a cooperative for Governor Macquarie on his last visit to the station, there are hints of his presence before that. Now, an example is in 1808, an Aboriginal man known as Port Stephens Robert was wanted for an attack on two sailors called John Spillers and John Bosch and a boy of 11. They had been expecting a shipwreck on the northern side of the harbour when they were attacked and the boy and Spillers were both killed. It was reported that Port Stephens Robert could be identified by the distinctive divot in the middle of his forehead that was a result of a fight with Bungary. After 1821, Bungary continues to show up in the area. His wife, Maruta, was likely from Lake Macquarie and Bungary had dealings with the Reverend Lancelot Threckold at his mission. As the report of Port Stephen's Robert shows, there was a simmering potential for violence on this isolated frontier. For example, the convicts who worked in the timber gangs or the lime burning fields were under constant military guard to both prevent them from running and to protect them from Aboriginal attacks. Morissette told John Thomas Big during his 1819 inquiry into the colony that the Aboriginal groups that harassed them were both troublesome and formidable. These two groups appeared to be especially vulnerable due to their often isolated working areas and probably due to their jobs actively at destroying the environment the Aboriginal people depended on, like forests and in the middens that represented their long occupation of the area. The vast middens built through generations of discarding ship shells and fish bones and other foodstuffs were also places where burial sometimes occurred, making them both special and sacred. Uh, next slide, please, Rachel. For many convicts though, <clears throat> the main interaction they might have with, had with Aboriginal people was to be tracked and possibly speared while attempting to escape. The first recorded convict to be speared was curiously enough though, not trying to escape from Newcastle, but instead trying to get there, having escaped from Sydney and headed north. In August 1804, James Field came into the newly established penal station, stripped, starved and speared. With two others, he had escaped in a boat from Sydney, only to be awashed ashore near Port Stephens where his two companions were soon after killed and he himself was badly wounded. However, in an example of the complexities of the frontier that often confounded the British, Field, after being attacked and surviving, was treated and fed by another group of Aboriginal people he had encountered closer to Newcastle. Then on arrival at Newcastle, Field proved to be the perfect propaganda weapon for the Commandant Charles Menzies, and he was paraded in front of the assembled convict workforce as an example of what would happen if they tried to escape. 
Despite the dangers, both real and imagined, convicts kept running right across the 20 years of the station's operational life. The risk of starving or getting lost was probably bigger for those who chose to bolt, but spearings were regularly reported. In 1807, the runaways Charles McMahon and Thomas Cowan were both caught at Broken Bay um, and both had spear wounds. Roger Farrell, was, who was sent to Newcastle in 1808 for supporting Governor Bly, witnessed a companion killed in a spear attack in 1810. In 1813, two escapees, Herbert Stiles and Ed Edwards, were both returned speared. And in 1816, five running convicts were speared in just four days in August. After this event, the, the Colonial Secretary John Campbell wrote that he agreed with the Commandant James Wallace that having so many speared would act as a good deterrent for those thinking of deserting in the future. And some convicts who ran and were never seen again were also likely the victims of Aboriginal spears. But not all victims were convicts. As we saw, the sailors, Spillers and Bosch had been attacked in 1808 and the young boy that was killed in 1814, a soldier chasing an absconding convict was speared. He was stripped and had his arms and ammunition taken. But more seriously, in 1817, the soldier Peter Cotcherton, a private in the 46th Regiment, was killed in a brutal skirmish with six Aboriginal men near Mount Sugarloaf to the west of Newcastle. Now, Cotcherton and a convict, George Little, had been out for four days hunting. On the second day, they were joined by two Aboriginal men named Babalu and Obiel, and several more joined them the following day. By day three, the party consisted of six Aboriginal men. So it's Babalu, Obio, Gorman, Young Crudgy, David Lowe, and Tenorano. You can see here there's a mix of traditional names and those given them by the British. So it shows a level of familiarity. Indeed, it was the convict George Little who reported after the events um, that were about to unfold, that identified each man, showing that he at least knew some of them by name, or knew all of them by name, in fact. The men joined Cotcherton and Little in a hunt, and on the fourth morning, Cotcherton invited them all to warm themselves at the fire. Now, Little reported, however, that two of them had stayed awake all night, suspicious of the Aboriginal men's intentions. Now, Cotcherton and Little both offered their jackets to Gorman and Obio, but as they did, Obio, Gorman, Young Crudgy, David Lowe, and Tenorano all suddenly grabbed and launched their spears, striking Little in the left arm and breast and killing Cotcherton with a spear to the chest. The men then gathered up the jackets and a kangaroo caught the day before and left Little for dead. Now, while there appears to have been few reactions when convicts were speared, the killing of the soldier was a very different matter. In response, James Wallace took hostages holding the wife and five children of a local elder, elder until the culprits were handed over. Gorman was eventually brought in by the, um, by the old man in exchange for his family. David Lowe and Obio were also eventually caught. And although Wallace released the man's family, the three prisoners, another woman and a child were all confined in the jail and we don't know what became of those prisoners. In some cases, Aboriginal, uh, sorry, absconding convicts also made deals with Aboriginal people. And in one unusual example, they worked together in robbing other convicts. In April 1818, the convict shepherd John O'Brien reported that he'd been overlooking his flock while sitting on a tree stump when he received a violent blow to the back of the head that knocked him down. When he opened his eyes, he saw the runway, runaway convict, James Top, standing over him with a tomahawk in his hand flanked by two Aboriginal men with their spears pointing at him in an attitude as if to spear him. He reported that Top instructed them not to spear O'Brien until he had given him another blow, whereupon O'Brien begged for his life and told Top to take whatever he desired. Top took a sheep and O'Brien managed to get back to camp and raise the alarm. As it happened, another convict, Alexander Thompson, was then in hospital having had experienced a similar attack. While returning over Shepherd's Hill, he had seen two Aboriginal men coming up from the beach who met him, but showed no violence or threat. This was the last thing he remembered before waking up in hospital, another victim of Top's troop. Top was subsequently captured by soldiers nearby and for his trouble, although he avoided a death sentence, he was first sent to Port Dalrymple, which is now Launceston, 
then back to Newcastle, then up to Port Macquarie, then back to Newcastle, and then into the convict system from which he did not get a pardon until 1849, after 35 years under sentence. But it was not only the British who were the victims of violence. Aboriginal people were also being attacked around the settlement. In October 1820, Roger Davies received 50 lashes for inhumanely ill-treating and cutting an Aboriginal man and intimidating him against bringing in bushrangers. Thomas Franklin and William Page both got 25 lashes for abusing and intimidating Aboriginal men against also bringing in bushrangers or runaway convicts. And in a very unusual case, and the only one I've come across, an Aboriginal man known as Flathead was flogged with 25 lashes for stealing blankets and provisions and being in the company of a man who had speared a white man in 1821. Uh, next slide, please, Rachel. But unlike the British deaths, though, most Aboriginal victims went unnamed, with one notable exception. In 1820, the local leader known as Borragon was killed by the escaping convict, John Kirby. Now, like Bungary, Barragon was a well-known leader in the Newcastle area. But unlike the former, we know very little about him, except for a few fleeting glimpses and the tantalizing tale of friendship with the Commandant James Wallace. On hearing of his death, Wallace, who had by then left his position as Commandant at Newcastle, wrote fondly of his friendship with Barragon. In a short letter, he wrote, and this is a quote, there are scenes in our lives to which we return back to with pleasurable, though perhaps with a tinge of melancholy feelings. And I now remember poor Jack or Barragon, the black savage ministering to my pleasures, fishing, kangaroo hunting, guiding me through trackless forests with more kindly feelings than I do many of my own color, kindred and nation. Now, although that language is a little jarring to our ears, it marks to some degree the friendship that Wallace felt. It should also be noted that Wallace had been given command of Newcastle by Governor Macquarie in reward for his work in the frontier conflict around Sydney in 1816 that culminated in the Athen Massacre. It shows some of the complexity of the colonial world that a man responsible for the largest massacre in the Sydney region could develop close ties to Aboriginal people almost immediately after. Indeed, as an amateur artist, Wallace painted Burragon in at least one group portrait uh, next as well, please, Rachel. And this is it here. And probably utilised Barragon's leadership and traditional skills to help create one of the largest collections of paintings of Aboriginal people and an intimate portrait of their cultural practices on country of any colonial setting via the convict artist Joseph Lysett. Barragon had probably been assisting convict artists from as early as 1813. In that year, the Commandant Thomas Scottale published the Select Specimens from Nature of Birds and Animals of New South Wales, an illustrated book of birds, fish, plants, and Aboriginal tools and weapons from Newcastle. The illustrations were completed by the convict artist T.R. or Richard Brown. Brown had arrived in Sydney as a convict from Dublin in 1810, and within a year had been sent to Newcastle, arriving in the penal station the same year, Scuttow. Between 1811 and 1814, during Scuttow's command, Brown illustrated the birds, fish and insects the Commandant collected. Evidence of the connection with local Aboriginal people can be found in the book, The Select Specimens from Nature. Its title page includes a scene at an Aboriginal camp, and each of the birds and fish is included with their Aboriginal names where known um, right through the book. Remaining at Newcastle until 1817, Brown also contributed to the album of watercolours put together by the Commandant James Wallace. And when he returned to Sydney, the artist made a series of native portraits of Aboriginal people, including Barragon and Coban Wohi of Ash Island in the Hunter River estuary. As well as appearing in Brown's painting, Wallace's group portrait and Wallace's group portrait, Barragon is portrayed by the convict engraver Walter Preston standing to the side of a corroboree. Uh, next one, please, Rachel. Barragon is probably also the guide and companion to convict artist Joseph Lysett. Like Brown and Preston, the convict Lysett was taken under the patronage of James Wallace and asked to paint the penal camp and its surrounds. Lysett was put to work recording the town as it evolved through Wallace's building program and capturing the life and customs of Aboriginal people. 
He painted at least 14 scenes that show Aboriginal people fishing, hunting, at play, at rest, and participating in quabberies and other traditional practices in and around Newcastle. Professor John Maynard has noticed that the Lyset paintings are invaluable in lifting the lid on an otherwise hidden past. And it is unlikely that Lyset could have come so close to Aboriginal people without an invitation of some kind. And it's likely that Burragon was responsible for arranging this. The work of Lysett, Brown, Wallace and Preston show another side to the harsh reality of the convict station that was experienced and remembered by most. <clears throat> but despite his connection though, as I said, Burragon was no safer from those harsh realities than anyone else. His murder by John Kirby in 1820 revealed the dangers of the convict station for Aboriginal people where desperate men were prepared to kill to avoid recapture. Kirby was tried for the killing and with enough British witnesses amongst the soldiers in a time when the Aboriginal evidence was disregarded, he was found guilty and executed. And he is the first British person to be tried and executed for the murder of an Aboriginal person in Australia, and which is 18 years before the trial of the Mile Creek killers. Now, although Aboriginal evidence was not considered uh, was not considered, sorry, a statement was made to the authorities by one of the Aboriginal witnesses, a man they knew as McGill, but whose traditional name was Biraban. Biraban was with Baragon on the day and had camped with him beforehand. Now, although I do not have time today to explore Biraban, from 1824, he had been assisting the newly arrived missionary Lancelot Threckold and became his main interpreter and intermediary. And like Baragon, his legacy lasts to this day, for it is with his help that Threckold managed to translate the Bible into the Newcastle and Hunter River language, to create a dictionary and to note the local grammar. And it's through the combination of these that the Newcastle language has survived. The next slide, please, Rachel. And so to conclude, the Aboriginal story of Newcastle is an important yet untold component of the wider story of this convict station. It is not only demonstrates the complexities of the colonial relationships outside of Sydney, but perhaps more importantly, it belies one of the foundation myths of the Newcastle station, that it was isolated. Aboriginal movement back and forth through the landscape by people like Bungaree just demonstrates the porous nature of the barriers there that the British saw and illustrates the connections between the Aboriginal hunter, colonial Sydney and the wider regions. Connections between the British authorities, escaping convicts and local Aboriginal people also help to complicate the otherwise overwhelming British story of the penal outpost. Burragon's role as a conduit for the convict artists or Biraban's as an interpreter and language specialist helped capture a moment in time for Aboriginal society that was rarely seen elsewhere. The connections between Aboriginal people themselves adds a new dimension to the history of Newcastle and its surrounds. Burragon was a leader of the Newcastle area. Biraban witnessed his death and had been camping with him and his family before that. Biraban goes on to assist Threckold at Lake Macquarie. Bungary takes his first wife from the Lake Macquarie area, and then comes and goes from the mission himself. All three men likely knew each other well. Each of them used their skills, their knowledge, and their connections to survive in a rapidly changing world around them. Thank you. I'll finish there, Rachel. Thanks so much, Mark. Um, bit of a team effort with the slides. Good job. <laughs> we did it. We did. Um, so some questions have been coming in. Um, so the first question is Bungaree's first wife, Matora, was yeah. an Awabakal woman. So he would have been able to communicate. Are you able to comment a bit more on that? Uh, yes. So I've... Um, I've gone into more detail about Bungary in the book and I've been following Bungary along for a little while because most of the stories we know of him is around Sydney. Um, but I believe 
that yes, he had this other connection to Newcastle, which was much deeper and more interesting. I well, I think, but then I'm a bit parochial. But it's certainly a different side of him than we have in the Sydney um, story. So his his first wife Maruta is said to be from Lake Macquarie. Um, again, a lot of these things are not entirely well known, but certainly Threkold talks of her and. Her name means um, little snapper in the local language. And she could have been, definitely could have been an Awabakal woman or maybe a Darkenjung woman from the central coast, but they kind of, they're right against the boundaries of each other and move back and forth. And yeah, I believe that Bungary certainly knew the Newcastle languages and probably the Hunter language. In a, in a later incident, um, the, the Kawabri I mentioned for Governor Macquarie, for example, is actually at Maitland. Uh, not in Newcastle. So that is further in, up the valley. Um, and so I think, yeah, Bungary knew the coastal language. Paul Irish has talked about this in his work, um, Hidden in Plain View, about a coastal language. And I believe Bungary sits inside that language group. So he could probably um, speak or at least understand Sydney dialects. Uh, he certainly could do um, Central Coast and Newcastle and probably into the Hunter. So that's the, what's so fascinating about his meeting with the man Budgery Dick from Lake Macquarie. I don't have um, any hesitation in saying they knew exactly what they were talking about to each other and what they, why they didn't say it to Grant is a mystery. Um, it will probably never be solved, unfortunately. Another question relating to uh, what you've talked about today and modern Newcastle. Mm -hmm. Is there any evidence that people can go up to Newcastle today and see some of the places that you've mentioned in your book? Uh, yes, there are. I mean, Newcastle is a, um, its convict heritage is, it's not as obvious and nor like many modern cities is its Aboriginal heritage as obvious, but there are certainly things you can see. So on um, anyone who knows Newcastle, for example, those, the Shepherd's Hills are still there, the green pasture and the Grant commented on is now King Edward Park at the back of Newcastle. And you can walk over those um, over those fields like everyone else did. It's never been developed or changed. Um, of course, Nobby's Island, which has the uh, lighthouse on it, has always been there. And there's lots of Aboriginal stories around Nobby's. Um, one of the ones that Threkold mentions and, and records, he recorded quite a few of the traditional stories, is that um, a kangaroo was hiding there in, you know, was escaping from uh, pursuers and hid amongst the, the rocks of Nobbies. And when it shifts around to get more comfortable, the land moves. Now, people might remember that Newcastle was the site of earthquakes. So this could be actually some story related to a longer, deeper history there. And Newcastle Council have put up some nice walking sort of path signs along the beaches where you can still see the coal lying on the ground. But also they've mentioned the various Aboriginal stories of the cliff faces where you have to walk silently in case the spirits move and drop rocks down and various things like that. So there's still that Aboriginal ideas. And, and there's still some convict areas. There's an archaeological site called the Lumber Yard, which you can go to, and a few others. It's not as obvious, but there are still things there. Yep. And somebody's asking you about the paintings. So the ones that you selected for your talk today and the ones that um, appear in your book mm -hmm. and how you um, came to choose those particular images, where you went to look for them. Um, so how I chose, I had more, of course, but uh, <laughs> space is always limited in a book. Um, the good thing about Newcastle or the Hunter in some ways is because it's such an early place that was settled by the British, there's quite a lot of um, painted scenes, actually. Um, there's a whole bunch of artists that were amongst the officer class up there. So one of the pictures I just showed of Newcastle as the town that has developed was by Edward Close, who was an officer um, and a, a sort of a magistrate there in the 1820s. Some of his material is in the State Library in the Mitchell Collection and some's in the National Library. Joseph Lysett, of course, has got a huge collection and you could, I could, you could pick any of the ones Lysett did and they will illustrate the point nicely. And most of those are at the National Library, but um, Mitchell also has copies of some of those and has one on display up in the galleries when they're reopened. 
And I mean, I just, so I suppose for others, there was a lot of searching and most of the images in the book do come from the State Library New South Wales collection, Mitchell Library collection, just because there's so many beautiful images from that early period in that space. I encourage anyone to search through them, they're fantastic. This question's a little bit more difficult. Do you have any evidence for the reasons that the Aboriginal people might have attacked the escaping convicts in Newcastle? So was it um, violence directed against the European presence itself or mm -hmm. at particular escapees? Right, that is interesting. Um, I, there's, there seems to be a variety of reasons and some will now know because some they just bring the convicts in or the, as I said, convicts disappear. Now in some cases, the British the British actively use Aboriginal people around Newcastle as part of the disciplinary kind of regime. And they, um, what you, for want of a better word, they pay Aboriginal people to bring convicts in. So they're paying them with blankets and food and tobacco and all these sort of stuff. And that's fairly common way that the British um, employ Aboriginal people, not just in Newcastle, but later as guides for explorers and all sorts of stuff. So there is a payment system happening um, I suspect as well that some convicts are being speared because they're straying either into Aboriginal camps or they're going very close or too close to sacred areas. So there's a whole series of no, well, known sacred places in the back of Lake Macquarie um, that were very important for initiation for men and women. And I suspect that there are some of those escapees running or going through those areas because that's really the only way you can get back. So, I, I mean, there's no proof of that, but that's my suspicion. And then there is violence around, I didn't really go into it, but there's, there's certainly violence of convict people, uh, convict men um, attacking Aboriginal women in Newcastle at this period. And that is really the seed that is planted for all, a lot of the violence that comes and explodes in the Hunter later in the 1820s. And it's happening there as well. And somebody's just asking a follow-up to that question um, and asking about when the violence, these clashes actually stopped. Were you still seeing it, for example, into the 1860s or was it much earlier than that? In the Hunter, um, so in 1820 or thereabouts, the first free settlers are given land in the Hunter and it really kicks off in 1822 when they open the valley for free settlement. And that's the catalyst for a much wider war. And it's a frontier war and the British at the time essentially talk of it as that in that way as well. And the most violent news in the Hunter are between about 1825 and 1828, 29, um, where there is an ongoing fighting and um, there's two massacres that we know of, probably more. And um, again, in the book I go into, <laughs> Even though the book is called The Convict Valley, it's actually quite a bit about the Aboriginal Valley and um, because the two stories are so intertwined and uh, there's uh, two or three chapters on the violence in the Hunter. Um, and it does keep going. It, it sort of peters out really in the 1840s, but there are isolated incidents into the 1850s. But by then there's the, the British, the settlers so overwhelmed the Aboriginal population that um, it's sort of the resistance is um, sporadic and the frontiers moved much further and much more violently north. A question about process and you've just alluded to that a little bit by saying that the book is the Convict Valley, you could have also perhaps called it the Aboriginal Valley. They're two quite complicated stories just yeah. following those two narratives through. Were you writing and researching those stories at the same time? Or were you sort of focusing on one or the other and then sort of switching when they directly interacted with each other? Um, hmm. A little bit of both. So the stories that I've just told now, for example, about Newcastle as the penal station, the Aboriginal and convict stories were, I was researching and writing both at the same time because the information in those around Newcastle is all from official correspondence and letters and, and reports. And a lot of them, um, for those who 
sort of do colonial research, you'd see that a lot of them, the first paragraph will be about escaping convicts, the second paragraph's about building a new wharf, and the third paragraph's about uh, Bungary being in Newcastle or some other Aboriginal person that is named. So I was catching all that in one go. So Newcastle came together as one story, which is sort of the, um, you know, <clears throat> to be honest about my work, I hadn't expected there to be such a huge Aboriginal story about the hunter because I grew up there and didn't, had never really thought about it. I mean, like a lot of people had not thought about it. So the Newcastle research really opened my eyes to this whole other story. And then in the later chapters of the book, again, a lot of the information around Aboriginal people is through letters and correspondence of the European settlers. And so again, it was coming both ways. So I would be reading, for example, for the C.H. Curry papers, I read a lot of the Scott family correspondence papers. Now they're talking about their convict workers in one page and about Aboriginal people in the next. And so again, it's working on the same sort of intertwined stories, but on the, in terms of violence, there was a big inquiry in the Hunter into the violence in, 18, in the middle of it, 1827. And so that was a very separate process. Yeah. And that's actually feeding into the next question, which is asking again about some of the sources that you've drawn on. Mm -hmm. You've talked a lot about letters and, um, from different people to their family and their colleagues. Um, but what about uh, mention of deeper conflicts in more official documents? So you've just mentioned that inquiry. Are they, is there anything else that people can look at? Um, in terms of official documents, not a huge, well, funnily enough, there is a huge amount, but it's only one collection. Um, and it is actually, it's at the State Records of New South Wales, although I know um, Mitchell Library has a copy on microfilm, because that's what I <laughs> But there was a massacre in the Hunter. And, but prior to the massacre, there was a, um, about seven Aboriginal men were captured by the mounted police. So the Hunter's one of the first places with, that the mounted police are deployed. They deploy them at the same time as Bathurst. In Bathurst, it, it's actually around the sort of the bushrangers and the war over there is coming to an end. Um, well, the official war. In the Hunter thereafter, they're chasing Aboriginal people. So they capture some Aboriginal men and essentially it comes out through Reverend Lancelot Threckold's connections that the Mounted Police had executed all these prisoners on the way back to Newcastle. And the governor decides at the time that there will then be an inquiry because this is unacceptable. And you know, you've, you've got to go, you've got to push it a fair way in colonial Australia to be unacceptable, to be honest. And but they have an inquiry and the inquiry runs, they interview all the mounted police, they interview some of the settlers and it's about oh, 200 plus pages of information. So that is full of stuff. And that's the main source of information around all that violence. Um, but then the Scott papers, which I looked at, of course, Robert Scott was one of the magistrates. He, so he also addresses it. Um, and then later there are inquiries into things like Aboriginal workers and stuff in the 1840s and they kind of give hints about what's going on, but also talk more broadly about where Aboriginal people are still um, located and working and name names and the rest of it. So there's a whole series of accounts, but this big um, inquiry is one of the ones that was the main source. And we also have a question, and this is possibly a little bit um, out of your geographical area, um, but is there any evidence that you've come across in your work of Bungary having um, connections further inland or northwest of the Hunter, so going up into areas such as Walker? Walker? Um, no, I have not, but Bungary has a few um, sons, but also by the 1830s there are a number of men named Bungary on blanket lists in the Hunter, so it could be someone there. I do have um, a very unusual or interesting connection with Bungary that I'm, and with the uh, help of Grace Carskins, Professor Grace Carskins and a few others we are currently investigating, um, because in the Robert Scott papers they talk about 
um, before they went to the Hunter Valley in 1820, they actually looked for land at Bathurst. And they had a guide from to take them over the mountains and his name was Bungary. And he goes with a woman whose name is also given and that um, corresponds very closely to one of Bungary's other wives' names. So we suspect that maybe he was going west over the mountains, um, but that's still under investigation. Uh, as far northwest as Walker, no, I'm not sure of that, but there were other people. But he certainly had wider connections than we suspected from his Sydney persona. It's always something more to find out and try and track down. I think that's all we have time for this morning, but I did promise everybody some information if you would like to buy Mark's book and have him sign it for you. So our colleagues in the bookshop, now this isn't a terribly sophisticated slide, but I thought this would be useful. So you can log online to the library's bookshop and you don't need an account. And if you use this code, which is good for today only, so it is CV for Convict Valley, and then today's date, 0707-2020. The bookshop will give you 10% off um, the Convict Valley by Mark Dunn. And as you are checking out, there is a section uh, where you can add your comments to the bookshop. And you can put in there whatever it is within reason, that you would like Mark to write um, in your book. So if you haven't yet uh, purchased a copy of The Convict Valley and you would like a personalised copy for your bookshelf, um, Mark will be going on site tomorrow and he'll be going through those orders with the team at the library and signing those books before they are posted out to you. So that's why that is for today only, as they say in retail. Um, well, yes, thank you, Rachel and the library. I did notice in the chat for the uh, last um, answer to a question, there was something about R.H. Matthews. I do know about him and he lived in Singleton where I grew up, so he's a favourite. And lots of other comments that we've sort of skipped over today for time, but lots of people saying thank you and so interesting and bringing all these people back to life for them, for histories that they may not have um, had access to perhaps when they were younger. So yeah. thank you for that. Um, if you would like to do a project as Mark has done at the State Library of New South Wales, applications for our fellowships are open now. Um, most of our fellowships in this offering are 12 or $20,000. There are lots of different opportunities. You can look at our website and see the different types of fellowships available and the different types of histories that um, we're able to support. And you can get your application in before 5 p.m. on Friday, the 17th of July. And also don't forget that this is part of a series. So you can join us next time for a Scholar Talk on Tuesday, the 4th of August, again at 11 o'clock, we'll have one of the library's senior curators, Elise Edmonds, with her paper, Visiting Mother, Australian Soldiers in London in World War I, where she'll be sharing some of her original research into the library's vast World War I collections. Until then, there's lots of stuff to do on your library at home, and I look forward to seeing you again soon. Bye-bye.